in different parts of a species range or different parts of the world, you see different species. Species have ranges. Uh, some species have large ranges. Some species have small ranges. And in different parts of ranges, you see different kinds of different parts of the world, you see different kinds of species or subspecies. So this is a very famous example, the hill miner. And if you look at its entire uh, range, you, you see hill miners with different wattle patterns occupying different parts of the range. And biogeography is interested in asking, how did this come to be? Why are species found in certain parts of the world? Why are they not found in certain parts of the world? Why are certain species found with other closely related species? Why are others not? So biogeography is basically the study of species distributions, or species ranges, both in geographic space and in geological time. So we look at patterns that exist today, and we try to understand them in the light of what's happened in the past. So this is uh, the field of biogeography. For example, if you look at camels, and you see their distribution, they're found in Africa, the Middle East, and in Central Asia, and also in South America. So you have the llamas, the vicuñas, and the alpacas, and so on in South America. And you have the dromedary camel at the back, the Bactrian camel in uh, Africa and Asia. How is it that these continents separated by so much sea can have species that are so closely related? So we know that the ancestors of the camels came from uh, North America and then spread down south. So what could it be? <coughs> what were the factors that allowed camels to occupy these very, very far-flung uh, areas? These are the kinds of questions that biogeography is interested in. And we talk about bird biogeography. And for that, we need to understand the geological history of <coughs> India. <coughs> India has been here where it is only for the last 40 million years. Uh, 130 million years ago, India was attached to Madagascar and Africa. So India was attached to the east coast of Africa. 130 million years ago, Madagascar and India split from Africa, started moving northeast towards Eurasia. They moved, they moved, they moved. 90 million years ago, Madagascar split from India. So India split from Madagascar and started moving north. And about 40 million years ago, 50 to 40 million years ago, the Indian plate collided with the Eurasian plate. So collided there, and that led to the uplift of the Himalayas. So the Himalayan mountain range would not have existed if India had not, if the Indian plate had not crashed into the Eurasian plate. And even today, the Himalayas are rising slightly because the Indian plate is still pushing a little north uh, every year. So the Himalayas uh, rise, and very interestingly, in the Western Ghats, you have something called the Algar Gap. You have uh, mountains, then a gap, then more mountains. And if you look at the Madagascar mountains in Madagascar on the east coast of Madagascar, they have exactly the same gap. So when Madagascar and India split, half that gap was left behind in Madagascar, and now we have the Palghat Gap, which is just uh, uh, reflective of the fact that at one point Madagascar and India were joined together. All right, let's look at what are called biogeographic realms. Biogeographic realms are areas of the world in which you find species that are very similar in their <coughs> evolutionary history. So there are a large number of biogeographical realms in the world. There are Neoarctic, there's the Neoarctic, which is North America, where you find species like the Cardinal. You have the Neotropical, where you have species like Tanagers. You have the Saharo Arabian, where typical species are species like the Bustard, the Palearctic, Finches and Tits and so on, the Oriental, which uh, a species that is represented in the Oriental realm is, are the Pittas. And then you have uh, Oceanic and Australian, where you find parrots and birds of paradise and so on. So the world has been divided into various biogeographical realms based on the kind of flora and fauna that are found there. And you look at India's position there, India overlaps three realms. It overlaps uh, the uh, Oriental, it overlaps the Sahara Arabian, and it overlaps the Palearctic. So we, the Indian subcontinent is at the confluence of three biogeographic realms, which is why we see the diversity of bird species that we see, because the contributions from all three biogeographic realms. So for example, the Palearctic uh, species that prefer cool, dry habitats, because Pale the Palearctic is uh, cool and dry, and species like tits, finches, accenters, 
that broadly are restricted to the uh, Trans Himalayas and the northern part of the Himalayas are Palearctic species. They're coming from the north, from, uh, from the Palearctic realm. You also have the Saharan Arabian species, which tend to occupy arid, uh, warm, and more open habitats. Right? So if you go into you know arid, dry grassland, see species like bustards, larks, and uh, the Tadoides babbler, the common babbler, the last great babbler. These are all <coughs> these originate from the Saharan Arabian. Uh, biogeographic realm. So they've come in from uh, the west, the Palearctics are coming from the north, because when India split from Madagascar and were, was moving up, there were no birds on India. Birds had not evolved yet. Right? So uh, India split from Madagascar 130 years ago, there were dinosaurs, <coughs> but there were no birds. So all the birds that we have in the Indian subcontinent have come from elsewhere. So we have the Saharo have been coming from the, uh, from the uh, west, the Palearctic coming from the north, but most of our birds are oriental. It's coming from Southeast Asia, South China. So uh, oriental birds, you find, they like and occupy warmer, wetter, uh, more forested habitats across the country. So minivets, babblers, leaf birds, fly catchers, warblers, pittas, uh, the green imperial pigeon, for example, if you look at its range, it likes the warmer, wetter parts <coughs> of the country. And this is the kind of pattern you will see for a lot of species in India because a large proportion of our, uh, bio, of our species are oriental. They come from southern China, Southeast Asia. So the entire Indian, all the birds in the Indian subcontinent have come in from somewhere else. We, the Indian plate did not have birds. Uh, so let's look at the colonization of the Indian subcontinent. We'll look at the oriental, uh, because we know that the Palearctic species came in from the north. They like the upper Himalayas and the uh, trans Himalayas. We know that the Saharo Arabian came in from the west and they like the arid uh, habitats that are in the peninsula and in central India. Let's look at the colonization of the Himalayas from, uh, South, from South China. When the Himalayas rise, species colonized from the east towards the west, right? Because all the species were here in the South China, Northern Burma region, and they colonized the Himalayas from east to west. But the Himalayas uh, show very, very strong gradients in temperature and in rainfall. The Western Himalaya are much drier than the Eastern Himalayas. And the Western Himalayas are also much more seasonal than the Eastern Himalayas. So if you just look at temperature in summer and temperature in winter, the temperature in summer and winter, the difference in temperature between summer and winter is much higher in the Western Himalayas than it is in the Eastern Himalayas. So the Eastern Himalayas are wetter, so that, that's, sorry, that's precipitation or rainfall. You see, uh, much higher precipitation in the east than you see in the west. The lighter the color, the lower the rainfall. And you have annual temperature variability on this graph. If you look at the east, it's a very low annual temperature variability. But as you go west, the difference between temperatures in summer and winter rises greatly. So the east is warm and wet. The west is seasonal and dry. And that has an influence on how birds have moved from the east to the west. So species that cannot deal with the high seasonality in the west. As, you move, as these species all start moving west, they reach a limit where the species says, look, the fluctuations in temperature are too much for me to deal with. I'm not going to go any further. So these species are restricted to the east. So you'll find species distributions like this, where presumably once it gets to Nepal, for this species, the temperature fluctuation is too much, or the dry, dryness is too much. And it says, that's it, I'm not going further west. And we also know that better dispersers of more mobile species, species that are migratory, species that are strong flyers, have been able to move further west than uh, species that are relatively <coughs> poor dispersers. Like the this long billed wren babbler hardly ever flies. You know, it just hops about on the ground and uh, feeds. So these species are not very mobile. They're more restricted to the east than species that are more mobile strong flyers and so on. So if you look at, uh, it's uh, very interesting, if you look at this pattern, let's say this is the eastern Himalayas, this is the western Himalayas, this is the number of species, each of these picks <coughs> is a species, and if the species is found in the eastern, in this part of the, this is the far eastern Himalayas, it will be colored grey. So this species is found here, but it's not found here, towards the west. And you see this pattern where as you go towards the west, species start dropping out. So the east has a large number of species. Not this. And as you go further towards the west, 
the number of species declines because species start dropping out. So in general, the Western uh, population, the Western community of birds is a subset of what's found in the East because species have been dropping out as you go towards. Is that, is that clear? And they drop out because either they're not good dispersers or they can't deal with that seasonality. In the Himalayas, there are two river valleys that are large biogeographic barriers. Biogeographic barriers means they're not easy to cross. So the Kali Gandaki in central Nepal and the Satluj uh, river valleys are very deep gorges. It's not easy for species to cross those uh, gorges. Um, and so movement across those bi biogeographic barriers is very, very limited, very, very difficult. And that leads, uh, so for a lot of species, you find that the distribution ranges end at the Kali Gandaki Valley. So like the grey sided laughing thrush, it's found in the eastern Himalayas, it's found in Southeast Asia, but once it reaches the Kali Gandaki Valley, its distribution stops. Similarly, with the Satluj Valley, the blue wing Minla does not extend beyond uh, the Satluj. So the Kali Gandaki and the Satluj Valleys are what are called biogeographic barriers uh, in the Himalayas. The biogeographic barriers lead to speciation. And how do they do that? So this arrow represents time. So right at the beginning, you have an original population. Then there's a barrier, right? So uh, let's say the Kali Gandaki River Valley is formed. Now that uh, original population is split into two, and over and they can't interbreed anymore. Now, over time, they're reproductively isolated. So there's no breeding happening across these two. You, they can't cross to breed with them. And then ultimately they end up becoming two new species through the process of speciation. And you see that across the Kali Gandaki. So you have the Himalayan woodpecker, which is distributed up to the Kali Gandaki Valley here. And you have a very close related species called the Darjali woodpecker that is found in the eastern Himalayas. And on one side of the Kali Gandaki you have the uh, Himalayan woodpecker, on the other side you have the Darjali woodpecker. So these biogeographic barriers have resulted in common populations being split up and then speciating into different species. Yeah? Alright, let's look at the colonization of the Western Ghats now. Again, everything in the Western Ghats has, has to have come from somewhere. But the Western Ghats are warm, wet. It's a warm, wet ecosystem. So the species that have colonized the Western Ghats are largely species from the Oriental region. And so you will find these species like this, like the Great Hornbill, which is found in the Himalayas and the Western Ghats but nowhere in between. Right? So these are called disjunct distributions. Right? They're not connected at all. So you have uh, the Himalayan uh, uh, range, Himalayan distribution, and then you have a uh, Western Ghats uh, uh, population. How did this happen? Well, there are two hypotheses. One is called the Satpura hypothesis. The Satpura hypothesis was a very influential concept uh, from, a, uh, from a, a researcher called Sundarlal Hora, who was looking at stream fish uh, in the uh, Satpura Mountains and the Western Ghats. And he hypothesized that the Western Ghats were colonized by species that went across the Satpura Mountain range in Central India, and then south. So they colonized the Ghats from the north to the south, moved across the Satpura Mountains, and then colonized the Ghats. Two three species, for example, the barbed flycatcher shrike that is found in, cent in the central Indian <coughs> mountains, as well as the Western Ghats and Northeast India, right? So that might be one uh, support for this Satpura hypothesis of the Satpura being a bridge that connects the Eastern Himalayas with the Western Ghats. The other possibility is that the species moved from North Northeast India down the Eastern Ghats and then colonized the Western Ghats from the south, northwards. So that's an alternative hypothesis. And you see species that have these kinds of distributions as well. So the vernal hanging parrot, or the lorikeet, you find it in Northeast India, you find it in the Eastern Ghats, and you find it in the Western Ghats. So potentially the Western Ghats could have been colonized for two routes. One is across the Satpura mountain range, and then further down south, or down the Western Ghats, uh, uh, down the Eastern Ghats, and then north into. So in peninsular India as well, like the Himalayas, there are biogeographic barriers. And this is work that uh, Robin and his team have done. Uh, so all these species were originally considered to be a single species, uh, the black crested bullbull. But 
these barriers have led to speciation. One of the barriers is the Pox Strait that separates India and Sri Lanka. So all these species have now, because of these biological barriers and because they're unable to breed across these biological barriers, they're reproductively isolated and new species have been formed. So you have the black-crested bulbul uh, over here, you have the ruby-throated bulbul in Sri Lanka, and the flame-throated bulbul in the uh, Western Alps. So all these points are various biogeographic barriers right, between Chotanagpur and here is the <coughs> biogeographic barrier, Chotanagpur and Sapura, there's a biogeographic barrier, and so on. So even in, in the peninsula of uh, India, you see these biogeographic barriers leading to speciation. One of the major biological bar uh, biogeographic barriers, and uh, this is again work by Robin, is the Palghat Gap. So you have the Western Ghats coming down from the north, a large gap where there are no mountains, and then the Western Ghats continue. So the Palghat Gap is a flat area that separates the northern Western Ghats and the southern Western Ghats. And the uh, white bellied shotwing, which is uh, now being renamed, uh, you see two different species on both sides of the Palghat Gap. So the separation between the isolation of these two populations on either side of the gap has led to speciation and there are two different species on either side of the Palghat Gap. Uh, I want to end by talking about, you know, we always think of uh, uh, species ranges as something static. It's found here, that's the way it is. It's been like that forever, but that's not the case. And the reason for that is, over geological time, over millions of years, the climate has changed multiple times. So you have had ice ages and what are called interglacials. So we are now living in an interglacial period, which means we are between two ice ages. The last ice age was about 22,000 years ago. And about 18,000 years ago, the ice melted. So about 22,000 years ago, all of this was extreme desert. Glaciers covered large parts of the Himalayas, except the northeastern part of the Himalayas. And life was, it was not possible for species to live in uh, large parts of the Himalayas because it was completely covered in ice. And a lot of the uh, habitat you see now in central India also was very different from what it is today. But there were what are called refugia. Refugia were places where <coughs> species could retreat to when they were pushed away by ice. So ice is coming, the glaciers expand, habitat starts changing, so these species have to retreat into pockets that are still suitable for species to live in, and those are called refugia. And the refugia in the Indian subcontinent were Northeast India and the Southern Western Ghats in Sri Lanka. Now, once these species all contract and reach the refugia and the ice starts melting, what happens is that suitable habitat comes back again. So now species come out of the refugia and start recolonizing these suitable habitats. So this is what's happening. During the Ice Age, species are retreating to these refugia. And then during the interglacial, when the ice melts and suitable habitat comes back, they recolonize uh, the suitable habitat from the refugia. So we've had multiple cycles of this happen uh, in the world, and of course in the Indian subcontinent, where you've had Glaciation followed by interglacials, and then another glaciation followed by uh, the retreat of glaciers. And this colonization, this push pull, this retreat and the colonization has happened over and over again. So we might be in our in our times living in an interglacial, still seeing potentially the recolonization of species further west in the Himalayas and further north in the. So if you look at, uh, yeah. But we'll get to that in uh, macroecology. So all these all these things put together, speciation, vicariance, causing species to split, biogeographic barriers, the ability of different species to move different distances, the ability of different species to tolerate different environmental conditions, ultimately results in species richness patterns uh, at large scales. 
so you have, this is bird species richness. Clearly, the most uh, species, the most species rich areas are the Amazon Basin and the Andes. The Rift Valley, uh, the mountains, the eastern arc mountains of Africa, and the uh, eastern Himalayas and northeast India. So all these various factors, biogeographic factors, have led to the emergence of these species richness patterns. And we'll talk about species richness patterns and how they might have, uh, how they have maintained when we talk about macroecology.